CataractCoach.com podcast series, episode number 19, today with Douglas Koch. Dr. Koch is an ophthalmologist specializing in anterior segment surgery, specifically cataract and refractive surgery, at Baylor University in Texas. I first met Dr. Koch many years ago when I was a medical student, flew into Baylor to interview with him, and he has just a magnetic personality. When you talk to him, you can tell he's incredibly bright. But he's also incredibly humble and easy to approach. Really an amazing combination. I've often said, if I had a quarter of Doug Koch's brain, I'd be a genius. And I say that completely with a straight face. He is that incredible. Now, I also enjoy learning from him. He's taught us so much about the posterior cornea. You remember all that? That was Dr. Koch. Or axial length modification for the high myopes to do IOL calculations more accurately. All these things originated from him. Truly a brilliant man, so much to learn, such a sweet person. I really love this podcast, and I'm sure you will too. Check it out. I want to welcome you guys back to our Cataract Coach podcast. And today we have one of my absolute idols in ophthalmology, Doug Koch from Baylor. I first met Dr. Koch when I was a fourth year med student interviewing for ophthalmology residency. And don't tell anyone, especially my kids, it was 1995. I graduated med school in 96, and when I interviewed there at Baylor, and back then, this was before COVID, before Zoom, we interviewed in person, I was blown away with this program. The amount of hands-on skill that you learn by doing at a huge VA, a huge county-type hospital, and more importantly, faculty who were so incredibly passionate. Ultimately, I chose to do residency at UCLA because of family reasons, close to home, but I've always had a fond place in my heart for Baylor, and in fact, in the last 20 years of UCLA ophthalmology residency, we've taken at least one Baylor med student every year for 20 years. So that, kind of, that hammers home the point that I'm a big fan of the Baylor program. So Doug, welcome to our podcast. And again, you are one of my absolute idols in the ophthalmology space. Thanks, Uday. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I am always so blown away by all you have done and contributed with Cataract Coach, which is such an amazing resource. Really, really uh, a wonderful contribution to our field. Yeah, well, as you know, the more you teach, the more you learn. I learn far more than I contribute. It's almost a guilty pleasure. You know, and that's so true. Even uh, with everything we do in our clinic with our, with our trainees, whether it's a student or a resident or a fellow, there are always everyday questions that I get asked that I don't know the answer to that. And, uh, <laughs> And I got to go think about it and try to figure it out. And some of those questions have led to some nice research projects. So, yeah. Absolutely. And we'll certainly delve, in, delve into that. But you also did a lot of teaching in cities all over the U.S. And in fact, all over the planet to really get the word out decades ago about the earlier innovations in ophthalmology, whether it be refractive or on the cataracts. Tell me more about that. Yeah, you know, I was privileged as a resident to work under Jared Embry, and he taught us FACO as residents, and I f finished my residency in 1981. So wow. there I am doing FACO on softer lenses, sure. before capsulorexis, um, before any kind of technique to bring it up. You know, we, we just kind of winged it. But, uh, and then extra cap came in, but then in the, in the sort of the early-ish uh, 80s, uh, around 1985, I jumped back into FACO in a bigger way, and then I started teaching it because I thought this is obviously the way to go. Now, we didn't have good foldable lenses, so we were still enlarging incisions to put in six millimeter lenses, but uh, they were obviously really just right behind us in terms of their evolution. Uh, and so I did a lot of teaching. I traveled around the country. I taught numerous FACO courses in our institution for people who came from all over the place and did live surgery. Glad I don't have to do that again. <laughs> that uh, is stressful, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it a bunch of places. It's stressful, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great educational uh, event, that's for sure. But, um, and then in refractive surgery, um, I sort of was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do with my career, and cataract and refractive just seemed so kind of close to me, that even in the 1980s. So I jumped in, uh, I did a little RK, and then I backed away and said, you know, there's just something that feels uncontrolled about this. And sure. as it turned out, you know, that's what, how it came about uh, in terms of people's long-term results. 
And then Exmer Laser came along, and uh, we got involved very early, uh, thanks to really support from a lot of people. Uh, Dan Dury got me my first microkeratome on a loan so I could start doing LASIK. Wow. So there are a lot of people that taught me a lot of stuff along the way, and then I decided that's an important thing to do research on. And we really focused our research at that point on complications and how to manage them and prevent them. DLK, STRI, that kind of thing. So, so back to the FACO days, when you were teaching FACO, this may be before most of our audience. Bef no clear corneal incisions. You're doing a scleral tunnel, but you're enlarging to about six millimeters for non-foldable ends. And it's before the advent of capsulorexis. So you're doing a can opener or a Christmas tree or some other type of capsulotomy. Exactly. And uh, at that point, too, there was no hydrodissection. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, it, it came in as we were still doing can openers, but initially there was no hydrodissection. We were just kind of breaking the nucleus up and just trying to suck out the pieces. The fluidics were terrible. There was very little control of the aspiration and flow rate and ch chamber stability. But, um, you know, most of the patients turned out great. And we were doing superior incisions, superior scleral tunnels. I mean, sure. unthinkable in this day and age, you know, in terms of that kind of challenge, except for, of course, uh, the mini extra cap procedure that's so wonderful for uh, developing nations. Yeah, the SICS, or the, the manual small incision cataract surgery, which when I was teaching residents, I made it a point to teach basically every resident how to do this. It's that magical of a procedure that I still do in Beverly Hills at least a couple times a year. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say I really have never mastered that. I'm just gutted out with FACO, but if I really had an opportunity, which I hope to someday, to travel and do more overseas, I'll, I will, I will study the feet of you and and, and people like uh, Jeff Petty and others who are so wonderful at teaching this. Yeah, it's an amazing procedure. But I'll admit, my experience is maybe even when teaching residents, maybe 30, 40 cases a year. So not a whole lot because if you go to other countries, surgeons will do fifty of these a day, a hundred of these a day. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like. It's a, it's, a, it's a humbling thing. Yeah, but what strikes me is that what you do today is nothing like what you were taught when you did your training. Nothing. Totally true. Um, the things I got out of my training were the things that really help you take good care of patients. My mentor, Jared Emery, was always listening to patients and talking with patients and trying to understand where they were coming from. And my chairman, Dan Jones, was so, such a wonderful mentor about thinking about problems, looking hard at the patient, and, and never taking anything for granted. Um, and so those two people had a huge influence on the way I kind of think about things. Um, and then if once, once you develop a mindset of curiosity, collaboration, concentration, and hard work, you know, a lot of good things happen. Yeah, it's funny. And you say it's, yeah, it's patient-centric. It's you, you learn from yeah. these mentors, basically, how to deliver the best care to that patient, irrespective of the technique or the technology. Absolutely right. And um, the other wonderful thing is, uh, most of my research interests have sprung from ha handling uh, challenging patient clinical problems. I well calculations after LASIK, the posterior cornea, um, all these complications from refractive surgery. These are things that I encountered in my practice, and I thought, something isn't clicking here. We, sure. need, we need a better way to do this. Tell me more about the posterior cornea thing, because it's as obvious as it sounds, the first time I heard your lecture about posterior cornea, I was blown away because I, I never even thought of it. And then when you said it, it obviously made sense. I was like, well, of course. Well, you know, it was a, a curious thing. Um, we had just gotten the Galilee, and I said, you know, I don't know that anybody's really paid any attention to the posterior cornea. Let's look at it. Sure. And we had this wonderful resident, or yeah, uh, medical student, Shazi Ali. And Shazi did all this work gathering data from 738 eyes. And with my colleague Lee Wong and Mitch Weikert we, and uh, Liz Yu, we analyzed these data. And uh, it just hit me like a ton of bricks that there was something really going on here. Yeah. But along with that, I had this, what I would call a seminal patient. And this patient was an engineer. He had with the rule astigmatism. He had one and a half diopters by the, on the anterior cornea. And he was very inquisitive. He said, how do you know what strength of the 
toric lens to pick. And I said, well, I was in the clinical trial. I know what to pick. Sure. So sure enough, I picked a 1.5 diopter lens that I flipped as astigmatism. He ended up with three quarters of a diopter against the rule. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then I had a lady who had against the rule of astigmatism who I undercorrected in the first eye and I didn't believe my results. So I undercorrected the second eye. It's like, oh no, you've got to be kidding me. And those two patients folding that into what I was finding on the posterior cornea. And it turns out a lot of people had thought about posterior cornea. Yeah. And I went back and Duke Elder in the late 1800s, Schoenig, from a, a Danish ophthalmologist who invented one of the bar- uh, aberometers that's used in the Elcon uh, Wavelight aberometer, he actually postulated there was posterior corneal astigmatism wow. based on his findings. And other, you know, Javal came up with stuff and there was a lot of stuff going on, but nobody had tied it to the difference between with the rule eyes and against the rule eyes. And certainly nobody had applied it to toric eye well calculations. And that was the start of the whole thing. Yeah, even for me, I remember seeing patients before you came out with this, and I didn't understand. The patient would end up perfect plano by some stroke of luck. As we know, to end up have that patient that's zero sphere, zero sill is a little bit of luck, and it only happens every so often. But I'd look at those eyes, and then I'd see the auto Ks, the keratometer printout that shows, yeah, he's perfectly spherical plus zero, cylinder zero, but the patient has 0.5 or 0.75 diopters on the anterior cornea of with the rule. I'm like, but how? It was a non-torque lens. And everybody attributed it to lens tilt. Right. Everybody said, oh, it's lens tilt. And don't get me wrong, lens tilt does play a role, but we're... We're not finding lens tilt to play as much of a role as we kind of thought it might. Uh, we, you know, work by Oliver Findel's group and our group, uh, and Mitch Weikert has done some wonderful work with Lee Wong and ZMAX, and we're not finding as much contribution from lens tilt as we thought. So there are still some big mysteries in toric eye well calculations, um, but uh, the posterior cornea is, is still hanging in there. <laughs> it's what, a big one. What do you think some of the mysteries are? I mean, obviously... We now we're learning that AC depth is obviously going to play a role because where the eye well sits. But and what else do you think would be important in, in torque? Uh, I don't think I don't think we have a a good measurement yet of the posterior cornea. I think that's okay. one of the fundamental weaknesses. Uh, there may be some other issues like surgically induced astigmatism and some other things. But you know it's interesting. The the, the, the for example the Amester seven hundred which gives you these marvelous readings and consistently sort of underplays the role of the posterior cornea when it does the final calculation for total corneal power. And yet, when you do a, if you do a toric eye wall calculation based on that total keratometry alone, you're still gonna undercorrect with the rule, overcorrect with the rule, and undercorrect against the rule eyes. So, is that posterior corneal measurement really right? Yeah. Uh, there's something still going on. There's still something we need to sort out. We're working on it, but it, we haven't cracked that one yet. That's yeah, why the, the yeah. that's why the formula. Sorry to interrupt, but the oh, no, the, the sure. toric eye well formulas that are based on mathematical formulas from based on only the anterior cornea. They're still consistently doing almost as well as any formula that incorporates the posterior cornea. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah not a whole lot of difference. I mean, I personally was humbled when I thought many years ago I did this study comparing residents surgically induced astigmatism to mine. And I thought, well, I've got these tens of thousands of cases under my belt. I'll be so much more accurate. And of course, the humbling part is we both, the resident group and me personally, the spread of SIA or surgically induced astigmatism was pretty wide. I thought it'd be this nice, tight, narrow bell curve. No, it's this big, wide spread. Right. It's crazy, (laughs) isn't it? Some of it's got to be measurement variability. Uh, Some of it is... uh, you know, if I have a, a my trainees, if I find them doing an anterior, too of a, much of an anterior corneal uh, approach, those patients, at least early on in the post-operative period, and by early on, I mean even as late as three weeks, they'll have one diopter of induced astigmatism against yeah. against the incision location. Yeah. But it does fade over time. But there, there, there's more. It's biological tissue. Right. And it's and gonna then, constantly kind of give us a challenge. Well, then you think of also corneal uh, elasticity, how it varies with age, corneal diameter, the white-to-white measurement, corneal pachymetry, kind of all these things play a role. I, I mean, that 2.2 incision in a cornea that's 10.5 millimeters wide is going to be different than in a cornea that's 12.5 millimeters wide. Oh, that's so true. 
So, so true. It's just it's kind of just all over the place. Tell me what yeah. got you. You I see you as an absolute godfather in ophthalmology, especially in the category for active side. You've done so much. How did you get so interested in ophthalmology when you went to med school? Is it something you always had an interest <laughs> in? I grew up in a small town in Michigan, Port Huron, Michigan, and my father was a physician. His father had been a farmer. And so we lived in a small town and just down the street from us was a guy named Nicholas Duvas. And Nick Duvas invented the second vitrector. Oh, you know, wow. there. And so he had people coming from all over the world to his little home on the lake and where he would show videos and teach people how to do vitrectomies with a Duvas roto extractor. Wow. Now, it, it, it was eclipsed by what Mockamer did. Sure. But that was my first sort of kind of teaser. But I really. I kind of lucked into it because I was in medical school. I had made all my applications for residency in pediatrics. And in July of my, between my third and fourth year, I took an ophthalmology rotation at Mass Ioneer where I was a medical student. And I went, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, I got to do this. I think it was the first, I think when I first looked in a slit lamp and saw an eye and saw what the potential was to, look at it and do things with it and hear people talk about things uh, from the standpoint of cataract surgery, glaucoma, corneal surgery, and so on. It's like, this is, this is my, what I want to do. So I quickly applied last minute and guess what? I misspelled ophthalmology in my application. No, that's too <laughs> funny. I love it. <laughs> O-P-T-H. Oh boy. And, uh, and so that, that's what, and then I just, that's what happened. But the funny thing is, it, to kind of carry that one step further, I was also going to become a pediatric ophthalmologist. I was working under the my mentor at those days in pediatric ophthalmology was Gunter von Norden, brilliant man who, in addition to all his work on strapismus, did all this work on amblyopia and the neurological aspects of amblyopia. Um, and I thought that was so amazing. And I had a fellowship all lined up. And in the middle of my third year, my my mentor in cataract surgery, Jared Emery, Jared Emery said, you know, I could use a partner. I went, wow. And then a week later, I had already lined up a, a, a fellowship with Art Jampolsky and, and Scott, uh, Alan Scott, at, uh, in, at, in, Cal in San Francisco. And I got a letter, letter from them saying that the funding for the fellowship fell through. Oh, boy. So... And I was already very attracted and attached to a Houston girl. So job, payment, Houston girl, big career change. So, yep, sounds like a plan. And in those days, cataract surgeons were not in academic centers. Jared Emery was the only academician who was really seriously doing cataract surgery as a primary emphasis. And the, all this stories about the buccaneers of cataract surgery and people doing wild and crazy things. And I was a pretty conservative guy from a little town in Michigan. So I thought, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. I may be way in over my head, but uh, you know, things happen. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? The saying is, life is what happens to you when you're busy trying to plan for it. Absolutely. So sometimes it's like, okay, you just you take it as it comes. Absolutely right. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, so I had a very similar thing. I just happened to do an ophthalmology rotation end of my third year, beginning of my fourth year of med school. And when I saw a patient with a white cataract have this elegant, like, 10, 15-minute surgery and then seize normally the next day, I thought I witnessed an actual miracle. That's a great, that's a great story. Yes, absolutely. So it just, it just absolutely I mean, you can blew my mind. It's either, you know, Ms. Jones, I'm going to add another blood pressure medicine to your regimen. Yeah. Or I'm going to make you see tomorrow. Why? <laughs> right. like, to this day, white cataracts are like my favorite. And I try my best to be so gentle, minimally invasive, atraumatic, recoat the endothelium with this with multiple times because I want, I want the post-op day one wow of 2020 or close to it vision. Isn't that the truth? I do the same thing. You, you want that, they want them the next day to just be weeping with joy. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. You also taught me, you were probably the first to ever tell, tell me that cataract surgery is our most powerful refractive procedure. Because when I was a resident in like late 1990s, 
Catholic surgery was one thing, refractive surgery was another. They weren't married. Right. Oh, that's so true. But I, I credit, again, my, uh, my mentor, Jared Emery, because uh, I did a weird fellowship. I spent time with David McIntyre in Bellevue, Washington, and he was doing manual extra cap, beautiful, elegant manual extra cap, because these were the extra cap days. I spent time with uh, uh, James Rousey, Jim Rousey in Oklahoma, and he was the one that was doing RK and using the cornea scope with placido rings to start to understand corneal measurements. But the cataract refractive link came by working with Clifford Terry in California, in Orange County, Fullerton. And Cliff invented the Terry keratometer, which was an intraoperative keratometer that you would use at the end of surgery to adjust your sutures to get just the right amount of, with the rule of stigmatism, so that as it, as it faded, hopefully you would end up with the right amount of final, the correct final amount of astigmatism. As it turns out, you know, with extra capsule surgery, that was a, that was a, a vain quest, sure. but the concept of, you know, really controlling the astigmatism with surgery was planted in my brain by that exposure to Cliff. So I owe him that. Yeah, so now it's crazy to think that, I mean, you, you can't think of character without thinking of the refractive component. It's just that that's an integral part of it. Whereas in the past, yeah, it had nothing to do with it. Right, so, so true. So in, in that light, also now looking at the lens counts, one of the other things that I, I loved from what you and Lee Wong and your group at Baylor did was the Wong Coke axial length adjustment for high myos. Because we've all been there. We've had these eyes. This is back, let's say, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. You have the highly myopic eyes where you say, oh, well, just use the SRKT formula, and you aim for minus a quarter, and they end up plus a half. And you're like, what happened? So how did you know yeah. those eyes had to be adjusted? Well, um... One of those C's I mentioned, collaboration. Sure. Lee came, Lee came to me one day and said, you know, we'd been, we'd been beating our heads against the wall for that same issue for you. And she said, you know, I just played around with optimizing the axial length. And I think it's going to work. So she came up with an initial formula. We worked on it. And sure enough, all of a sudden, the spread went from this to this. And it was amazing how tight it made everything. And, you know, when we introduced that to the world, um, we got a lot of pushback. And some of it was legitimate. Some of it was based from some of the ray tracing docs who said, well, it's because you're using these artificially high values for K readings in the IOL calculation formulas. But still nobody was getting as accurate results as we were with this yeah. regression method. And, uh, and then, you know, Graham Barrett saw it and he folded that into his formula along with some other stuff, but it just, it just spread like wildfire, wildfire. And so a lot of people are still doing optimizing in their formulas, or they at least are doing other ways to really try to account for that. Um, but it's, it's it, you know, when you think about it, a long eye patient shouldn't have a problem with effective lens position because the eye well power right. is relatively low. Yeah. So, you know, you, you ought to be pretty darn accurate. And, tr you know, we just looked at some data from that Warren Hill gave us of 1,600 eyes, and we were 93% within a half diopter. You know, oh, it's like, fantastic. wow. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, we have... I was say, if, yeah, on your point, if your IO power is zero, let's say ultra high myop, or even a one diopter lens, if it's zero, certainly where you put that lens in the eye, the effective lens position has nothing to do with it. So these low yeah. diopteric powers, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then it begs the question, should we optimize for all axial lengths then, different optimization? Or should we do it for all K ranges or all AC depth ranges? We, you know, we've done a couple of papers on that topic of uh, looking at segmenting the axial lengths. Sure. In other words, uh, you know, there's a different refractive index for the cornea, for the aqueous, for the lens, and for the vitreous. And you should take that entire optical pathway and break it down into its elements and adjust each element that way. And we found that it helps a little bit. We thought it might help more for short eyes where we have all this problem, you know, sure. these short eyes are all over the place. It hasn't really panned out. And I think that's because most of the formulas have done such a good job of incorporating this stuff in their kind of regression approach that it hasn't made that much of a difference. So, I, I mean, do I think that we'll ultimately be doing that routinely? Sure. But, you know, right now we're still, 
we're still stumbling over corneal measurements and ELP. Right. Right. I mean, that's right. just yeah. those are still our bugaboos, right? Those are the ones that, are, and for the eyes with a regular, uh, a cornea is you know with a regular astigmatism, certainly the contribution of the cornea to the refractive power is difficult to pin down, and that's another element, which is where ray tracing ought to really shine. Right. It also begs the question that is the concept of an A constant reasonable? Yeah. To the point where I mean, because that's like. You raise all eyes or lower all eyes? And you can't like treat like this ultra high myopi with a 29 millimeter axial length compared to in a four millimeter deep, deep AC compared to that 19 millimeter axial length eye with the cornea power of 50 and an AC depth of two. You can't like, but the eight constant treats them the same. Now, that is so true. Um, and of course, clinicians in practice, they don't have the time to optimize their constants right. for each, each axial length. I think that's where an interesting role of AI is. I mean, look sure. at Warren Hill's formula. Warren doesn't calculate an effective lens position. He, Warren just says, Here are this, here's this incredible network of data of the, all these parameters. And if, you know, Mr. Smith has this, this, and this, and this, that's the IOL. It, it's kind of interesting. And, you know, um, Zeiss has done an interesting thing with their new formula. I don't know if you know about the Zeiss AO, AI IOL calculator. They start off by ray tracing 500,000 eyes with all kinds of data points sure. so that they, they kind of train the data set and then they get data from veracity and go through it and develop a formula from it constraining the data by the 500,000 eyes. And I tell you, that looks that's looking pretty good. We did a study we're publishing on short eyes that shows it's it's the most accurate formula out there. Now, it's still not great. It's only like 75% within a half sure. diopter for short eyes, but it's an interesting approach where you're using ray tracing and AI. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, on a recent podcast, I also talked to Randy Olson from Utah, another absolutely brilliant person who, I mean, he talked about refractive index shaping, of adjusting the refractive index of any existing IOL in the eye with a, with a, with a femtosecond laser after the fact. And that just sounds like, wow, we don't, all you gotta do is just, for, uh, for our lens cocks now, just get the ball on the green and then use that to just sink the putt. Right. It's, uh, it's a bigger challenge than, than it seems to be. And, and I think that um, I work with one of the companies, Perfect Lens, and uh, they're doing interesting work on it, but it's a challenge to, because to, to change the power and create that new uh, refractive lens within the lens, uh, takes a fair amount of time, and the fixation of the eye is so critical. There's still things to be worked out. I, sure. I, what I th where I think that's going to go is companies are going to develop biomaterials for IOLs that are easy to adjust that way. Oh, makes so sense. The, treat the treatment might take 10 seconds instead of two minutes. It'll be interesting to see where it, where it goes, um, but it is a really intriguing approach. And uh, uh, Obviously, that leads us to the whole conversation about post-op modification, which is so interesting and, I think, obviously growing in interest among all of us. Yeah, so I always think of the leap. The leap we went from ex manual extra cap with these, with these can openers and these sutures and non photo lenses to where we are today. And then now the next leap to like this, you know, adjustable lenses and whatever, even a combination of lenses, doesn't seem like that much of a more of a leap. I know, isn't that crazy? Right. It's amazing, it's just amazing. The accommodative lenses, I think, are still befuddling us. I don't, I don't think yeah. we're there yet. Uh, you know, you look at all the data that are out there, you know, they kind of turn into a, a kind of an EDOF sure. kind of quality to the, what they can do. So we're still a long ways from that, and I still have questions about the long-term function yeah. that they're going to provide. I mean, the good thing though with the company lenses, with so many horses in that race, I think one of them is going to cross the finish line. Yeah. Not sure when or not sure which one. <laughs> Obviously, I have yeah. my own horse in the race in that, but I think it's a neat concept. And I think we're, we're also learning along the way. Like I, I worked as my disclosure, I, I did the first uh, lens gen Juvene IOLs back in 2015 in Panama. I did the first ones ever. Wow. And that was really, yeah, that's a really neat thing. It's been eight years. But what the amazing part was, was by keeping the caps or bag fully open, there's been like a zero PCO rate. No poster capsule basket, period. Which you would never expect. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? 
So it's like we, we looked, saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We 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 did. Uh, I was in the trial, clinical trial for the synchrony. Remember that? Sure. That silicone lens that had a high anterior optic that so that when the capsule would contract, it would move forward. Yep. Those capsules were totally clear. Like you said, I had. I think I had. I did ten patients, and this was like fifteen years, ten years, fifteen years ago. I've done one yag. Those yeah, ten. it's wild. I was in Brazil a month ago at the Brazilian Cataract Refractor Meeting. By the way, an amazing meeting, mm-hmm. and I love these Brazilian ophthalmologists. But Liliana Werner presented a paper of hers from Utah about like these these things about keeping the bag open and how that prevents PCO. And I was like, wow, it just blew my mind. This is nothing we we would not have even thought of it ten years ago. No. Yeah. Again, it's just good observation of when you try something and you get an observation and you go, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a fantastic time to be an ophthalmologist. I tell both of my kids, like, listen, this is an amazing field. I can't tell you how happy I am. I am cuckoo right. for cataracts. I just can't get enough. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. It's a, where, where do you think we're going then in the future with this? In, in the future of ophthalmology as a whole? And also, I also want to get you to put on academic ophthalmology. You have a very keen insight there. And one of the, the challenges I see is that we, only still, we still only train 450, 460 ophthalmologists a year for all of the USA. Yeah, that's, we, we really do need more. I mean, uh, obviously, we're all getting busier and busier. Sure. And, uh, you know, a lot of physicians, as we know, are dropping out. A lot of physicians dropped out for COVID. Uh, others are just kind of getting burned out by the whole kind of insurance and all the kind of hassles. Um, and uh, so I think that's a very legitimate concern throughout medicine and, and certainly for ophthalmology as well. It's funny because 20 years ago, we thought we were going to have a surfeit of ophthalmologists. Right. We're going to have too many. And then within like five, six, seven, eight years, they said, whoops, got that wrong. We're not, have, <laughs> not going to have enough. <laughs> uh, I worry about academic ophthalmology because of how expensive it is to run a medical school. Yeah. And the deans in medical schools are under great pressure from their boards, from their, you know, college, the university con- chancellors to perform financially. And they, you know, they have to also teach medical students and do a lot of things that are not sufficiently remunerative to pay for the cost that they generate. So that means that surgeons like doctors like myself in academic settings, a fair amount of our income goes to supporting the college, the medical school. And so, you know, young doctors coming out, particularly if they come out carrying a big burden of debt from loans, student loans, uh, you know, they got to look around and say, well, I can go into academics, but, you know, so you have to do as much as you can to kind of help them financially. And, um, you know, when I started practice, we had a surplus of money in our department. We could do all kinds of things. And then we so the dean started taking more and more. The dean's tax. The dean, yeah, the dean's tax got higher. Yeah. And the other thing that happened is if we would generate a surplus at the end of the year, instead of being able to retain it and use it for development within the department and do things for the faculty, the dean said, thank you very much. <laughs> And I, you know, I don't criticize them for that. I understand they're under pr- this pressure from above, but it, I think it's a, it's a challenge in medical schools uh, uh, because of all those uh, sort of factors. Uh, and I do worry about, you know, retaining and, and generating interest among young physicians to join and become academic ophthalmologists. Uh, certainly, teaching ophthalmologists. Oh. I mean, one of the salvations that I've seen is that some many private practices do a wonderful job of contributing in that way. You're a great example of that. You're a master teacher. You've devoted a tremendous amount of time to it, and yet you have your practice. So you've, you've, you've recognized the need, and you have the joy of teaching. But we need a gazillion more Udays, you know? Yeah. It's tough, though. I mean, the challenge is there. I, I was very happy. I did half-time private practice and half-time teaching residents for 22 years. And I estimate about 10,000 resident cases attended total. So pretty, pretty good clip, about 200 residents because we're a big program, we're 80 years at UCLA. And I really enjoyed it, but I just felt that it was, there was a lot more uphill battle regarding bureaucracy, administration, those kind of things that really took away a lot of the joy of it for me. Yeah, yeah. 
And so when they yeah. said, I asked, what's, what's the earliest I can retire and get the pension? And they said, 52. I said, hey, just so happens I just turned 52. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, to me, it was, it's not a dropping the microphone moment. It's more of a passing the baton, though. And right. I think the new person who's taking over my spot, which is at a big county hospital called Olive View, UCLA Med Center, which is a fantastic facility. I love the place, love the patients, love the nurses. Is a really fantastic young, young ophthalmologist. She's a retina specialist from Bascom, probably 40-ish years old, named Jay Sridhar. And he, he, he oh, runs, sure. Yeah, he runs a great podcast from the, from the cutter's mouth, of it, the, the, the retina podcast. I think he'll do an amazing job. He has my full support. It's time for him to shine. I don't want to keep sitting at that position. All right. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the things I've tried to do in my practice is is really layer in my successors. Yeah. So, you know, Mitch Weikert, who is sort of 10, 15 years behind me. And then there's, uh, you know, Samitra Candlewall. And then yeah. we have Masay Ahmed, who is, you may not know, but you will know. He's this marvelous guy. He's been our practice for three years now. He's already our residency director. Incredible guy. And we're bringing Allison Chen into our practice. And she's a very creative, very energetic woman. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody will stay and, and hang in there and that the department will create an environment or preserve an environment and makes them want to continue to do what we do. Yeah, it's fun to pass the baton to the young ones. It's so neat. It, it, it gives you back that young energy. Like people say, why do you attend residents? I say, because it just gives me energy to see this young person, the smile on their face, and they finally figure out that chop. It right. just, it's amazing. It, it is a great feeling. There's no question about it. It's just unbeatable um, to see residents grow and, you know, see these first-year residents come in and, no, you've got to do it this way and that way. <laughs> and, uh, um, and actually, a lot of that teaching now is done by my, uh, some of my junior colleagues who have this amazing patience and, 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 and joy in, in, in taking the young residents. I kind of get more of the senior residents, and, which is also fun, trying to take them through the more complex cases. For sure. And you also have an amazing fellowship. When I was a, res when I was a resident, I was finishing my residency, I only looked at three fellowships. I looked at your fellowship to Baylor, which I thought was amazing. I looked at uh, Dick Lindstrom's in, in Minneapolis. And then I looked at, uh, at the time, Peter McDonald was still at UC Irvine. I looked at his. Those are the only three I looked at. Ultimately, I decided that I don't know if I needed the fellowship. I'm, I was driven enough to learn on my own. So I, I opted not to do a fellowship. But tell me more about yours, because back then, it was absolutely one of the top on my radar. Yeah, we have a, I think we have a great fellowship because we have this really such a diverse faculty. I mean, Steve Flugfelder, you know, I mean, there's, he's like the world's best guy in the ocular surface. Bose Hamill, who does all kinds of intricate and inter interesting surgery, um, iris surgery and that kind of thing. Mitch Weikert, who does it all and does it all incredibly well. Sumitra Candlewall, who was a Lindstrom fellow and uh, from that group, Minnesota Eye Consultants, and brought all these skills and... She's multi-talented and so organized and so focused on the teaching mission. And then Masi Ahmed. So we have a lot of people, and I do, I have this refractive background for teaching, you know, getting them trained in the STAR S4 and LASIK and all that kind of thing. So we have this diversity of people with their specialty and special interests. Um, and it really, I think it makes a really rich experience. So we, we usually have fantastic fellows and we have such a wonderful time with them. They're, they're lifelong buddies, you know. Yeah, they really you, are. You work you, so closely with them, you know, for a year. And yeah, you also have an amazing facility for different for different hospitals, different teaching sites. You get a huge patient population, a very varied pathology. Yep, absolutely. We have Connie hospitals, you know, just crazy busy, and then our VA was super busy, and then our our, our own clinical practices at the, at Baylor. Yeah, that's just makes it for for a fantastic kind of mixed, you know group yeah. of patients to do everything. Um, do you think we'll get to the point where we're doing more fellowships that are like yours? Because in the old days, it was kind of like a more cornea fellowship, and there were some other fel glaucoma fellowship, but there wasn't really a, a cataract refractive type fellowship until kind of you, you and Lindstrom and maybe Peter McDonald kind of pioneered that. Are we getting more and more of that now? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the AUPO, you know, which oversees the corneal fellowship, does really a great job. Um, that's, that came from the cornea background. And so the primary numbers that you have to meet are corneal, PKPs, DMAX, DSEX. Um, 
but they're branching out. They're 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 thinking about adding complex cataracts to the to the mix, IOL exchanges, which I've been pushing them to do. Sure. Because a cornea specialist needs to know how to do that stuff, um, and they're adding a little bit of exposure to cross-linking, and then if you have a refractive component to your fellowship, certain basic numbers. I think there are going to be a lot of people who are going to do purely cataract and cornea. I think there'll be a small subset of them that'll be doing refractive. I don't think that we'll see a huge... Refractive is such its own special deal with its own sure. special requirements. You know that very well. And so I think that there'll be some fellowships that try to do it all like we do. And there'll be some that'll say, I'm going to be almost only cornea and others they are going to be more cornea cataract. I do. I will say that the the, the fellows that I, uh, you know, bring in, I I I do teach them cataract surgery. It sounds kind sure. of funny, but no, for sure. there's a lot to learn from residency, even though they come from wonderful programs. There's so much still to learn. Well, heck, I'm still learning. So what can I tell you? So, <laughs> well, that's, that's actually say, very sage advice. If you're a young ophthalmologist, you're a resident, and you think, "Wow, I've got this great residency. I'm going to do 300 facos or more during my residency." I hate to be the one to tell you. That's not even halfway up the cataract learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. You'll find out. When you hit case 1,000, you'll say, oh, wow, 300 was just baby steps. But you're right. Yeah. And we, and we continue to learn. Uh, that's another caveat. You know, if I had done this cornea fellowship 20 years ago, DSEC, DMET, didn't invent, they weren't invented. Right. If, I, if I had done a retina fellowship 20 years ago, there was no OCT. There was no anti-VEGF. Yeah. So the bottom exactly. line is, like we talked at the beginning of this conversation, you've taught yourself, whatever you do today is nothing of what you were taught. You, taught the, you were taught the basic building blocks and patient interaction skills, but everything you do now, you've learned along the way. Totally. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's, that's what's so cool about our field. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's not only, you know, cognitive learning, which is huge in our field, but skill learning acquisition of new abilities and skills which is uh, constantly you know constantly challenging and and so exciting yeah and the neat part too is that we're so visual obviously in the surgery but even how we learn and we have these obviously surgery with a microscope we've got a camera there i hate to even admit but i probably want 30 minutes to an hour of surgical videos a day i'm just so yeah. bananas about learning this like i don't watch netflix i don't watch hbo I watch YouTube videos. This is what I do. Wow. And part of it too is uh, for cataract coach, I get submitted five or 10 videos are sent to me a day and I want to give them the honor of watching all of them. So I wow. learn from them and, and that's, how, yeah. that's, how, that's how I learned DMEC. I watched a video of DMEC of some amazing surgeons. Martin Dirasamer from Austria, Peter Veldman, University of Chicago. They make it look so easy. So I watched their video, I pieced them together, I emailed them and I said, hey, do you mind if I put these 10 videos of yours together into like a compilation and I'll put it up on Cataract Coach? I watched it 50 times before my first DMEC. Wow. So I went in there, did, it with, did a DMEC with a resident. I just tell you, it's much, it looks much easier than it actually is. <laughs> but finally, yeah. like six, eight, 10 DMECs later, I was pretty good and I just kept teaching the residents. But yeah, that's how we learn. It's all, right. Watching. And now the amazing part is your phone, you can watch this anywhere on the planet in high definition on your mobile phone. Uh, it's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's just totally a, unreal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, look what COVID showed us too about, uh, you know, distant learning or, or remote learning. Um, you know, I mean, we had people from India doing these fantastic meetings, pulling yeah. people from all over the world. Two days worth of meetings and during, you know, at the height of COVID when nobody was traveling. Speakers from here, there, everywhere, Latin America, you know, uh, Asia, India, uh, uh, all over. Yeah. And it's, and it's just, what, a, what an amazing thing we have going now. Yeah, that's why I started the cataract coach thing. I said, you know, if I can make a video every day, yeah, five minutes, and just get one little point across. In a year, that's a lot of new learning for Boy. me and the viewers. Right, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, fun stuff. What advice would you have to young people who are now, our podcast, our, our cataract coach website is obviously skew, skews on the younger side. So most of the people who watch it are thir ages 30s and 40s. What advice do you have these young people for uh, maximizing your learning, maximizing your career? Well, I, you know, um, I think you, once you get into practice, you begin to figure out what you really like. 
mm-hmm. you don't really know when you start practice. Do you like doing this? Do you like doing that? Um, and I think you have to listen to yourself when you encounter that sort of moment. Uh, do you want to be the person that spends a ton of time with patients and does a lot of personal counseling and helps them with you know, very elaborate eye well discussions? Do you want to be a person who just wants to be super busy? Do you want to be a teacher? You want to have time for research? You know, you, be, you have to begin to carve your path. And um, I see people going all over the place. My fellows who have graduated have gone sure. into academics and come back out. They've gone to private practice, gone into academics. And uh, so uh, the, I think that obviously we, we all sort of sense that the, the younger generation, millennials and so on, are really much more attuned to the whole family thing and to a balance in their lives than maybe us baby boomers who are like, <laughs> you know, pretty driven. Um, and I think that's wonderful. But um, I, I, the other thing I would say is don't give up on meetings. Don't give up mm-hmm. on going to meetings and don't rely only on videos and that sort of thing. Because when you go to a meeting and you hear people talk, then all of a sudden there's you're, in, you're exposed to things you might not be exposed to if you're deliberately just saying, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going there. And I think there's something that's really expansive about being mixed with the crowd. You don't have to go to th- four meetings a year. Go to a couple. You know, go to Ascaris. Go to the Academy. Do, you know, or go to a local meeting. And then that will supplement what you get from things like Cataract Coach, I think. But I, 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 don't, I, I fear that people are going to pull away more and more from that. And I think that's a loss to them uh, in their growth. I totally agree. Just... Meeting with colleagues at the at the ASCRS or the Academy or other, but even local, you, said, you said local meetings, that's where a lot of the discussions you pick up the kind of the best pearls. Yeah, and you you, you hear things, you know, you bump into an Uday Devgan and you ask him a question, and that leads to some other question, and all of a sudden, then you're learning about how he managed his career, and you, the, the, all this stuff can be learned that you don't listen or don't learn by just pushing a button on your computer and watching a podcast or yeah. a video. Not that I'm dissing those in any way. Those are so important. But it, it, it's the whole combination, I think, that enriches a person's professional growth. Yeah, I know, for sure. I think you need all of them. I think you, you benefit yeah. from all of them. And and plus, meetings are fun. I love, I love catching up with colleagues and seeing people, even for like a, a fleeting glance. Hey, how are you? Just to see right. the person. There's, a, there's it, something about the human in nature. You need that human-human interaction. Right, right. Yeah, and you know, also to hear people argue and debate is fantastic. <laughs> you know, no, pollution marginal generation has nothing to do with keratoconus. It's a part of keratoconus. You know, and then you start to talk about all the nuances of these topographic and and uh, yeah. and, and corneal findings. You know, it's good stuff. Yeah, I know it. You know that I love the point counterpoint. I did a cataract coach symposium at the ASCRS. And I chose two panelists. And I chose them because, A, they're super smart, smarter than I am. I chose Rosa Bragamili and, uh, from Toronto and Deepinder Dhaliwal from Pittsburgh. Both absolute geniuses, incredible surgeons. And I know both of them personally, and, I, and they promised me they will bust my chops. They will put me through the grinder. So I showed a case and here's what I did. And they, they were so, it was so good. The interaction was like, no, you should have done this differently. And no, and this. Right. That was the best learning. I learned so much. Right. You couldn't have picked two better people. They are so brilliant and so strong and so right there. Yeah. yeah. And, not, and not afraid to tell me what I did wrong. No, you should have done this. Right. <laughs> Which Probably is, not, not uh, as gently as that. <laughs> no, you know, that that's, that's the best part. It's just like it's right. such great learning. If I got a little mad from other people like, you know, Amar Agarwal, show your complications, show your nightmares. That's what, no, I'm not going to ever show you a cherry pick case that makes me look slick. I'm going to show you a case that I said, oh, I should have done something differently here. Like one right. of the cases I showed was a patient that I had a, a post-op problem with, a cataract cataract surgery complicated with RK and, a, and ocular service issues. And, and I said to you and, and Steve Flugfelder, you guys, woo, save my skin. And so I, 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 I used that case so I could summarize, well, what did we learn from the whole process? Because I know that the difference between a mistake and a lesson is you learn from the lesson. So let me say, here's what happened, here's how it was rolled, here's how these two guys in Houston saved me, and here are my take-home lessons. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think that can help, hopefully, I'm not a lot of other surgeons out there yeah. when they get in the same situation. And I'm sure some of my patients have found their way to you. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it does end up being a pretty small world. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice do you have these guys besides? So you want to definitely go to these meetings. Obviously, keep up on learning. We talked about work-life balance, which I did a very poor job of early on. I, I did way too much traveling when my kids were young and only uh, later figured out that uh, I missed out on so much. Right. So I think that, I think that's I think I think people are clued into that much, much more so than we were. Um, and, you know, it's uh, these are kind of troubling times. You know, you know, when I when I was beginning practice and doing all this, uh, America was the, the, the kingpin in the world. And. You know, we finally got rid of the, uh, the Soviet Union and, and the, sure. the Berlin Wall. And we kind of thought we were in this amazing time of open-mindedness and liberal democracy. The world has gotten challenging now. Yeah. There, there, there's a lot going on in the world. And so I think the only other device I would give to people is be, be a little conservative about your finances and what you do, kind of, mm-hmm. be, you know, Start to build that nest egg early. I was taught to do that by my mentor, Jared Emery. Get your nest egg, build it, protect it. Don't put it in crypto. <laughs> <laughs> put it in something conservative so it yeah. grows in a conservative way. Um, and, you know, build that nest egg early because we don't kind of know what kind of ups and downs in the world and the finances are going to occur. And, uh, and, you know, just keep building your practice and doing a great job so that you always will have work that you love and will be supporting your family. Yeah, that's the neat thing with what we do. It's just, it's not work. It's so much fun. I mean, yeah, I, I could be on vacation. I could think, I know it's a beautiful time. It's a beautiful view. Look at what a beautiful city, but I kind of wish I was in the OR. I kind of <laughs> wish I was doing surgery. And my family will say, Dad, what are you talking about? Look, how, do, wait, how can you think of work? I'm like, it's not yeah. you. It's not really work. It's kind of funny. That's yeah, funny. <laughs> but yeah, I also, I also took those lessons to heart too. I, uh, I lived like a resident for as long as I could after residency. Drove my 18-year-old Volkswagen Jetta with 200,000 miles on it. Like, I will drive this car till the wheels fall off. I'm going to live like a resident as long as possible. There you go. Yeah. I, I was putting money away very early into a 401k. And, uh, you know, I was, I was getting a little pushback from the family. We could have a nicer vacation. I said, well, I think you'll like me better later on. <laughs> it's true how that works out. So what do you yeah. think is coming finally for ophthalmology? I think we talked a little bit about accommodating lenses, maybe refractive index shaping for, lens, for IOLs. What else do you think is coming down in the cataract refractive cornea world in, in the, let's say, 5, 10, 15-year mark? Well, I think we're going to see um, a kind of a... A, a, a mini resurgence of refractive surgery, a corneal refractive surgery with procedures that are gentler on the cornea. I think SMILE and some of those other procedures show real promise to be uh, a little less invasive. Um, and uh, some of the new femtosecond lasers for making flaps are, I think, amazing um, sure. from several companies. Um, so I and, and the accuracy of refractive surgery and the modulation post-op, you know, we just got new information about treating haze with Losartan. I mean, new things that are coming along that way. But um, I think we'll see a, a fair amount more refractive surgery. I think we'll see lens surgery at a younger age as, as, it, as things get safer. But I think we're still going to be limited by the risks of cataract surgery and lens surgery, particularly in axial myopes at mm-hmm. a young age. We have not solved that problem uh, because of the risk of retinal detachment. Um, but I, I, I think that we're going to be faced with a lot of cataracts to do and not enough of us to do them. And some of the high volume scenarios are going to have to really come to play for us to stay on top of things. Right. I, mean, I can, with, with more and more of the population becoming myopic, you see some of the stats that 80% of Hong Kong and Singapore youth, in fact, people under age 30, or 80% are myopic. And you I see now, you see kids... Two-year-olds, three-year-olds sitting in their stroller on, their, on, their, on an iPhone playing some right. game or watching some movie. So the instance of myopia thing is going to go up. I'm just thinking that what's natural is you get braces when you turn like 12, 13 years old. What did you just get care to refractive surgery when you turn 20, 22? Yeah. 
it's hard because we know you need an adjustable procedure because yeah. the 20-year-old is going to get progressively more myopic. You know, you could leave them plus two, which is not a bad thing to do, really. Um, but it's tricky because of the, the need to be able to do something sequentially. We've talked so many for so long about, you know, we can do this at 20, we can do this at 30, we can do this at 40, you know, that you can't, but you really can't. I mean, yeah. you really can't. You really can't take up someone who's had LASIK at 21. You lift their flap at 31. You might get epi and growth. You can yeah. do PRK. It's not quite as accurate. We haven't gotten to the point yet where we have really adjustable or repeatable procedures uh, that's going to take us to a, you know, every decade. You know, every, you know, you you, you you change your clothes, you change your corneal power, or whatever it is. I mean, there's discussion of refractive index shaving for the cornea. Um, with the company Clario, um, brilliant people like Scott McRae working on it, but I haven't heard anything about where that is now and what kind of progress they're making. So that the, the silence on the airwaves is concerning that it's not turning out the way they hoped. Right. And then as you said, for hopefully we'll start to see probably more refractive lens exchange at younger and younger ages, maybe in people in their 50s. Well, when, yeah. when, when presbyopia really hits, we'll elect to do something that restores their range of vision. Yeah, particularly for the uh, the uh, amitropic presbyopes uh, and the hyperopic uh, and the low low myopic, uh, I think the the twenty six millimeter and higher eyes will be again remain a bit of a concern. We keep thinking we can do these patients with impunity, and the data still show you know an unacceptably high risk of retinal detachment unless they're really in a bind. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we see that now with these right these axial myopes. Even they have a beautiful cataract surgery. And two years later, they've got an attachment. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. We, we, we've all seen, seen that. We've all been there. Right. But certainly, I think it's an ex incredible time to be an ophthalmologist. I, I think I'm like you. Every day, I'm thankful that I'm an ophthalmologist. Yeah. And uh, just happy that I have this opportunity to help so many patients so many different ways. Yeah, it's wonderful. We are really fortunate we found. We're fortunate we got into this field. And we're fortunate we got in this field at this point in the field when it was undergoing this unbelievable transition, particularly for me and the, you know, I, my third year uh, as a resident, I did an intercap, an extra cap, and a FACO all in the same day. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, because of the different lenses and the different, yeah. so it's an interesting time for us now because of the, the continued refinement, but you and I both went through a period where it was ex the explosion of technology right. that took us to where right. we are. And now we're building on that for these extra refinements. And I, I should have measured things like extra better measurements, uh, better predictions, all kinds of things that are going to happen to make things better. Um, it's, it's just a great field to be in. Right. I may have to add for our younger audience members an intercap. What is an intercap? You may have to explain this, Doug. Intercap, they kind of know extracap. That's like SICS, but an older version. Can you explain oh, um, what intercap is? Because a lot of, I bet you a lot of people, young ophthalmologists do not know. So you uh, do a, a conjunctival pyridomy and you fold the conjunctiva over. You make a huge, long 10, 11 millimeter incision. And you take some forceps and you lift up the cornea. You may inject alpha chymotrypsin to weaken the zonules. And then you take a cryoprobe and you put it on the lens and you just gently move the lens back and forth, hoping against hope <laughs> that you don't break the lens capsule. And then you work that lens out through this huge incision and hope that the mother vitreous doesn't follow you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I have a And number, then you put it down and do a zillion sutures. <laughs> and then the patients uh, break their hips uh, with a fall, you know, six months later because they don't have an IOL. Yeah, just, wow. I mean, yeah, you're right. The, the distance we've come in the last couple decades is unbelievable. Yeah. But I just think, honestly, when some people say, well, we missed the golden era of ophthalmology. It was back in the day. I think, no, just wait. The next yeah. 10, 20, 30 years, you'll be amazed. We'll do even more amazing things. I, I completely agree. There's so many brilliant people working in so many interesting areas. Um, I, I, it's, it's phenomenal. Right, and thank you. there are a ton of brilliant people. So if any of the young ophthalmologists think, gosh, everyone ophthalmology is smarter than me, believe me, this is my sentiment. I feel like I'm dumber than a bucket of rocks because you're around people in ophthalmology who are so incredibly brilliant. Yeah. But whatever your flavor that you bring to the table is, believe me, 
that's well and good and plenty sufficient. So don't remember, comparison to the thief of joy. Don't compare yourself to others. I learned this the hard way. I only compare myself to me. And I'm right. just asking for a 1% a, a year incremental improvement. It's all I ask. And the other thing I would say is when you're in practice and when you're taking care of patients, if you see something that doesn't make sense, that piques your interest or you can't explain with anything, don't blow it off. Trust your instincts to explore it further and think about it because those, the germ of so many ideas comes from that very moment of puzzlement when you encounter a clinical problem. And it's amazing the number of people in all realms of ophthalmology who have made huge contributions by that, the insights that they come upon in their clinical practice. Wow, that's probably a great end point because you said at the beginning of this, you just noticed, wow, the patients seem like there's gotta be some involvement with the posterior cornea based on your own patients in clinic. You had your own myopes in clinic where, gosh, I thought they were gonna end up minus a half and here they are plus a half. That piqued your interest for the, the axial length adjustment. You had patients who said, yeah, I did RK on and oh, I don't think this is the right thing. You trusted your, in your instincts, your judgment. Right. So yeah, really, exactly. you take it from your clinic, your clinical experience. When you notice something, don't ignore it. I love that point. Think yeah. about it, put it on your back burner. Yeah, there's a lot of noise out there <laughs> that's telling you other things. Right. Trust your instincts. Oh, that is fantastic. Well, thank you, Doug, for doing this interview. It's a big deal to me. Again, you've been one of my idols since I was a medical student and I've learned so much from you over the years. I, should, I feel like it should probably pay you royalties. I've, I've learned so much from you. So keep up the amazing work. And I'll remind you guys that, of course, we have a new Cataract Coach podcast every single week. Tune in and you can download these on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, anywhere you get your podcast. Plus, it's going to be on cataractcoach.com and, of course, on our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. All right. Thanks, today. Thank you for enjoying that podcast with me. So much to learn from Doug Koch. And I can only imagine what he's going to innovate in the years to come. I want to remind you that we have this podcast also as audio-only version. Amazon, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast from, you can get this podcast. It's also on YouTube as a video and, of course, on cataractcoach.com. I want to hear from you. Tell me your suggestions. What can we do better on this podcast? Who should we have as a guest? How should we take this podcast in the future? Do you like the format of about an hour as an interview with a well-known ophthalmologist? Let me know and give us some feedback. Appreciate it.